So I guess that's the best we can do for right now. We have to acknowledge a truth, admit the problem, and then fight with all of our might against it. That's right. Uh, if you were ever proud of America for defeating the Nazis, then you have to vote for Democrats now because this fascist movement is alive and well in the American Republican Party. Well said. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. Today's podcast is a candid conversation with Ruth ben Giat. Ruth is a professor of history and Italian studies at NYU, advisor to protect democracy, and the recipient of the Guggenheim and other fellowships. The author of Strong Men, From Mussolini to the Present, Ruth is also the author of Lucid, a newsletter about abuses of power and how to counter them on Substack. Ruth is also a regular columnist and writer for MSNBC, CNN, Washington Post, and The Atlantic, and is a regular commentator on mainstream media about authoritarianism and the threats to democracy around the world. I'm having her on today to talk about what we learned in season one of the 1-6 hearings and where she, as an expert in authoritarianism and strongmen, sees America sitting right now, what we can expect moving forward, or better yet, what we have to work diligently to avoid. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, professor, author, and expert on authoritarianism, Ruth ben Giat. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Well, thank you for joining me today. Sadly, your expertise on authoritarianism isn't just useful as a history professor. It is deeply relevant to our modern day society in America. Yeah. Who, who knew that uh, fascism and coups and um, I wrote the book Strongman, and a third of it's about coups. And I myself uh, was already an expert on fascism, but I didn't know as much about coups, and I learned a lot. Never thought it would be applicable to the USA. (laughs) I know, right? I think most of us are, even the ones who are paying attention, are pretty shocked that this is our reality. And I think we have to kind of make sure that the people in our lives realize how serious this is. And I know you were following the January 6th hearings closely because you were all over television providing commentary about it. But um, I understand that the final night of the hearings before the committee returns in the fall were of particular interest to you because they focused on Trump's personal role in citing the violence. Now, as an expert on strongman behavior, you literally wrote the book. Um, You point out that the authoritarian-minded leaders, these guys that are desperate to remain in power, will act recklessly, whether that's starting a war or staging a coup or some sort of other desperate action or violent move, that this kind of behavior is a key factor that differentiates an authoritarian from a democratically-minded leader. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. In fact, I I had to turn in the the book uh, the summer of 2020, and so I <laughs> predicted that Trump wouldn't leave quietly. I didn't know, of course, what would happen, but I, I had a very bad feeling because Trump's personality, his character traits, unfortunately for us, as we've seen what's happened, they're very similar to other authoritarian leaders have studied. The outcome's different today. I mean, we don't have as many one-party dictatorships like in the fascist years, but the damage and the ruin uh, and the and the vengefulness, if they think they have to leave office, always leads to disaster. And it's really that you know men like Trump. It's it's not only that they um, they're kind of I don't use the word narcissism in the book, but that's they they need the adulation, they need the control, they need the power, and they also need immunity from prosecution. <laughs> and Trump, like Putin in Russia and Berlusconi in Italy, was actually under investigation when he ran for office. And so with this kind of ruler, they, they, even if they get elected you know, fairly, um, governance is a way to avoid prosecution. And what Trump was able to do was domesticate the GOP and make it his personal tool. So when he was going to be impeached, uh, he had these loyalty quotients to make sure that nobody, you know, in his own party to punish them if they voted for his impeachment. So he survived that way. So having to leave office is just out of the question. They can't accept that their time is over. They can't accept that they're going to just be eclipsed. And so also with Putin, one of the reasons I think Putin, you know, a- a- attacked Ukraine when he did is that he saw that he was at his peak. And so he started thinking, how can I secure my place in history? 
So right. this is this he's talking is all kind of, about Peter the Great and everything. That's right? it. That's it. So 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 this is what kind of you know Trump. This is what the mindset of Trump was, and and basically the from the point of view of leader cults and um, how authoritarians treat their followers, the GOP's main job from November to January six was to kind of try and keep him in office. And so we had all these leaked texts of senators saying, I'm working 14 hours a day, like Senator Mike Lee. You know, I'm trying to do what Trump wants us to do. So from my point of view, as somebody who studies these leader cults, the whole thing was this like leader cult rescue operation. That makes perfect sense. I mean, your book, in your book, I think it has a great quote that says, the authoritarian playbook has no chapter on failure right? It has no pages on how to deal with being a national disgrace. And then you say, you know, look at someone like Pinochet, who was pelted with tomatoes and eggs when he appeared in public after leaving office, or someone like Idi Amin, right, who was forced into exile. And these men who base their entire persona on being these virile leader types, strong men, aging, defeat, the ebbing of their powers is difficult for them because their entire sense of self is tied up in being revered, right? And you note that while Democratic heads of state often see the end of their time in office as an opportunity to build sort of leadership legacies elsewhere with things like foundation, the Clinton Foundation, the Obama Foundation, the authoritarian regards the end of being worshipped by his followers and controlling everyone and being in charge of everything and losing immunity from prosecution, as you point out, as this existential threat, which yeah. perhaps in many ways it is, right? But they're not willing to go quietly. No. And so now we're in a different phase, but highly, highly dangerous, not only because January 6th further radicalized the the GOP um, and and really uh, gave new gave new oxygen, despite the fact that the coup failed. It gave new oxygen to this fusion that's been ongoing of extremists in the GOP. But if if Trump comes back to the White House, things will uh, happen in a very accelerated manner because one of the main uh, personality characteristics of these guys is that they're uh, vengefulness. They're out for retribution. And I wouldn't like to see that happen to my country. Uh, What, what would happen and and the speed it would happen at if Trump comes back. So this is why if anybody, if you know people who don't normally vote, uh, we have to do everything possible to prevent him from coming back into office. Without a doubt. I mean, you look at all the actions he took even after losing the election, right? From November 2020 to the actual insurrection on January 6th, right? We've seen this through the the committee hearings, right? First of all, he refused to admit he lost, right? Then he ignored all the experts and advisors who told him he'd lost. Then he declared himself the winner, despite all evidence to the contrary. He lied to his supporters. He fundraised off that lie. He illegally pressured state legislatures and election workers to overturn the results. He illegally pressured the Department of Justice to just say the election was stolen, right? Then he illegally pressured the vice president to refuse to certify the election. Then he knowingly sent an armed mob to the Capitol to stop a peaceful transfer of power. And even after that mob had failed to deliver him what he wanted, he continued to pressure the congressional allies, right? People that still hold seats of power today, people in Congress today to refuse to certify his loss. You know, we even watched him in those outtakes on the last night of the hearings on January 7th, still refusing to say the election was over and he's still doing it today, right? And these are all key key things to an authoritarian behavior. So if we put that man back in power again, which is astounding to me after that list of things I just told you that we could even consider doing that, um, where would that leave us? In a, in a terrible place, because one of the things that the big lie did, uh, it was, it was, you know, we're going to look back and see the big lie as one of the most successful propaganda campaigns in history to get 40 million people in a country that had no precedent for this to just discard their you know evidence of their eyes and ears and and believe that he won but psychologically can i ask you something ruth yeah. as an expert in that is that because 
the right wing already had a propaganda machine set up. Yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Usually when an authoritarian comes in, they have to do what Putin did or do what they did in, in Hungary or yeah. Belarus and to start taking over the media. But in this case, they already had Fox News set up. Then they launched OAN. Then they launched Newsmax. Yeah. So they already had a right wing propaganda machine. And then the left wing doesn't have a machine. And if anything, the left wing or mainstream media mainstream. is constantly trying to prove that they're not one way or the other. So they often give equal weight to things that are not equal. So I feel that's like he was right. already in a position. That's right. There, so that, that's a very good analysis of like the, the, the landscape. And the, it's hard. Yeah, it's really hard. And one advantage that uh, Trump had is that when I say that he put the GOP under a kind of authoritarian style party discipline, what he did in, in this area was to impose a unified messaging. There are talking points, you have to respect them. And we saw what happened, for example, Ted Cruz, who's a total fanatic and, and party line guy, but he made a mistake. Uh, a few months ago, he, he said that January 6th was a terrorist, a domestic terrorist event. And Tucker Carlson hauled him onto his show and publicly humiliated him because, so Carlson isn't just a highly effective propagandist with repetition of the talking points. He's also become what I call an authoritarian enforcer, an enforcer of the uh. party line. And so if you, the way I see the GOP is really through this lens. I, I've, I've studied many other parties that are actual authoritarian parties and I'm looking at the GOP. And so imposing a unified messaging because you can't have any dissent inside the party is a huge advantage with respect to um, certainly the Democratic Party, which is about pluralism. We're not we're not uh, we're not trying to kill people if they don't you know uh, vote the, the way or do what we say. And then the mainstream media was un, unprepared for Trump and was doing the both sides thing. And when Marty Baron, the former head of the Washington Post, said early on, "We're not at war; we're at work." I understand that was, you know, the, the kind of maintenance of professional ethics, but they are under siege. In fact, anybody who's not the right wing is now under siege. And so that uh, in the end is not is not the only solution. You can't just be at work. You have to be far more vehement defending democracy than that. Yeah, especially since the very first thing to go in an authoritarian regime would be them, the free press. That's right. Right. And that's one of the signs. If you want to know, if you look around the world and you see people, you want to know, are they an ascendant strongman? Uh, one of the things you look at is, are they going after the press? Um, yeah. Also, are they preaching violence? Um, so I freaked out when January 2016, when Trump said, I could stand on Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and I wouldn't lose any followers. And I literally ran home through Washington Square Park, downtown Manhattan, to write an op-ed because who does this? Duterte does this in the Philippines. He says, I'm going to kill everyone if I get into power. Um, they kill all the drug dealers. And they talk about violence so that they can cultivate extremists and violent people to be on their side. And they go after Which the press. Which has worked. And then they label the right. press political enemies. And so these are the things that these are some of, some of the many things that Trump did, which were totally unprecedented, because a lot of Americans were already racist. They already hated immigrants. They already you know, were suspicious of Jews or Muslims. But having um, Democrats be political enemies who had to be locked up, like Clinton, and having the press become a political enemy, those were new. Because it's not just my political opponent, it's now become my political enemy. These people That's are right. bad and they're evil. That's right. right? That, that's the shift. Do you think that that was done naturally by Trump because he just innately understands how people think? Or do you think this, because I, I don't think he thought this through. I don't even think he thought he was going to win. I mean, in 2016, I think he was surprised that he won. I think it was a plan for something else that took on a life of its own. But I feel like the GOP was primed for this mm -hmm. kind of of government and he just happened to be the catalyst to it because the 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 speed at which the GOP has changed its tune where they preach freedom but they're talking about burning books and banning people and you know limiting human rights um it seems all part and parcel of a much larger project that they were kind of just waiting for 
the last domino to fall. And now it's almost mm-hmm. like an avalanche. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting, it's an interesting, um, it's a central question. And basically the GOP was already on this trajectory and you had the Tea Party. However, then you have the meeting of personality and circumstance, as I call it. And Trump, uh, like, like Mussolini and others in the past, he was, a lot of these guys come from the field of journalism or communications. And they, it's like they, and, and Trump was also a marketer. And he had been trying to run for president uh, in the past for many years, but it wasn't the right time. And he kind of scanned the marketplace and he realized that there was a, a space for somebody who would elevate extremists, would be openly racist, be openly misogynist. And so he reached out to those people. Now, the party was ready and a lot of the grassroots was ready, but he he consciously reached out to them and told them, you know, you 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 are I, he elevated them. You're the forgotten ones. I'm right. going to save you. And so so it was deliberate. And the cultivation of extremists was it was deliberate. And I actually advised the January 6th committee on these issues. Um, I was interviewed twice by the January 6th committee. So he was retweeting early in his campaign, uh, very, very often white supremacist propaganda. Um, and, and so he, this, so he, there's no manual and he doesn't read Trump. However, uh, he, he did things very deliberately to go after a certain part of the population advised by Bannon, by Stone. And he surrounded himself with people who had a long experience, sometimes decades of experience wrecking democracies like Paul Manafort and Roger Stone. You know, right. they had, they had a lobbying firm. Uh, and in the 1980s, they were hired by Ferdinand Marcos, the dictator of the Philippines, to uh, kind of justify a fraudulent election. And this is the 80s. So these people have been doing this for a really long time. And together with Trump, th- there was a lot of foresight and planning involved. And this deferral to violence that you're talking about, this like opening the door to violence, a way to handle a situation that isn't going the way you want is a terrible precedent to set. And, you know, he sort of tested the waters with that. I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue thing. And it just went downhill from there. You know, Democrats and the establishment weren't just the targets either. You know, you look at you've called the violence almost bipartisan at this point, you know, like Trump was willing to take out his own vice president for disloyalty. If you're not with me, you're against me. He had it coming. He let me down. I mean, this is real strongman stuff, right? You're willing to take out Republicans and Democrats alike if they don't have allegiance to you because That's ultimately it. it is you. That's all the, all the scary thing uh, among all the scary things, uh, a particularly scary thing <laughs> is that, and there are these cycles in history that these, these men use and discard everyone. They have allegiance right. to no one. Uh, maybe their family, but some of them have part. I mean, when we're talking people like Saddam Hussein or whatever, they they would his they, sons, yeah, mm-hmm, yeah, they don't hesitate, and so it makes perfect sense that he's going after. And now it's not just him; it's the whole. You know, again, the party line becomes more and more extreme. So you had that guy Eric Greitens, who was like, "We're going to hunt down these, you know, Republicans in name only." And this is a, a an authoritarian logic. Where this is the guy that did the ads where he was rhino hunting and kicking down doors and they were going to find Republicans in name only and kill them is essentially what he was saying. Exactly. So, so this is unfortunately what happens. And only way later do some of these, in this case, it's Republicans, wake up and realize that they were used by the leader. <laughs> And yeah, uh, well, I mean, it goes back to people don't like to talk about um, Hitler or any of those years because it always seems extremist, but it all feels like it's from the same playbook. You know, I think that the, you know, you look at it, the German parliament thought they could control him, right? They thought they had him under control and he ultimately just uh, just dissolved the parliament, right? (laughs) He stayed in charge and they all went away. And I think that's the thing about these strongmen leaders. You give them an inch, they're going to take a mile and they're going to kick the rest of you out while they're at it. That, that's exactly what happens, and um, it's very it's very tragic that um, what's that the Republican Party, which again again in, was in part a target. Um, look at Josh Hawley, 
Um, it's been fun to see all those memes of him. Do I have to? <laughs> but but ima- but think about like think about how incredible it is that this was someone who had to run for his life. So he incited, he helped to incite the mob with his famous fist pump. Then he has to run for his life, and then he's still a faithful Republican. So think about the level of corruption that all of these people who had their lives threatened are agreeing to still back this party that threatened their lives. This is the only way to understand this is through authoritarian uh, logic. It it has, this has no, there's no frame for this in democracies. Um, Right. And it's a legitimate fear. Yeah, and we're actually in kind of uncharted terrain because I was doing some research on, uh, like, because normally when you have a coup, either it, it either it succeeds and then and you often have like a dictatorship, whatever, um, or it fails and then the people are if you, if it's like Erdogan in Turkey, they tried to have a coup against him in 2016, and he's an authoritarian, so they're all in jail and and right. all kinds of things happen to them. But I was looking to see what happens when you have a so-called self-coup. That's Trump's case, where you're already in power, you're trying to stay there. It's a self-coup. And um, the times where those coups have failed, all the cases that I've found so far, the the leader had to leave the country. (laughs) I don't know of any other case uh, in a bipartisan democracy, especially where the person just stayed around and the party still supports him and now he might be running again. So this is, I just want to stress that we are really in like uncharted waters, as they say. No, we really are. I mean, you look at the number of people in the Trump administration that resigned after January 6th, that that was their bridge too far. They'd worked for him the whole time, but January 6th, they had to resign. Or there's people speaking up now because the dam's breaking a bit and they feel like they might be able to say something. So they're, you know, they had mostly Republican um, people on the panel speaking um, as witnesses. But what struck me was the number of people who said they didn't want to leave because they were concerned who would fill their role if they left, that they were worried Mm -hmm. that what would happen with a completely unsupervised Trump in charge. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people told themselves they were sticking around to insulate the country from the president's darkest instincts or to make sure he wasn't Mm -hmm. getting advice from the yesiest of yes men, right? But I often feel that it was also that continued support for him of so many high ranking people that gave him the legitimacy that he needed to do all these things. Like if, if enough people at the beginning had been like, this guy's absolutely out of his mind, we're not doing it. Instead of saying it secretly, it might've been different. And what's your thought on that? I mean, I think we just got lucky, right? We, we did. We got very, we, we got very lucky because we came very close to a very different outcome. Yeah. Um, but that's one reason I wrote the book, which is full of these case studies of of people um, seeing that there's some demagogue partnering with the demagogue and then not realizing till it's too late uh, that that maybe he was not what he seemed or maybe they'd been deluded by him. Um, yeah. But it's also shown, you know, we always like perhaps we think of civil service or bureaucracy as boring. But look at how important it is Um, because all the people uh, testifying, I mean, not all of them, but many of them are kind of lower level um, Mm -hmm. civil servants who decided to come forth at great risk to themselves. And another reason people stuck around. So you, you stick around because you think it's what you said. You think that a worse person will come. So you think that by sticking around, you're going to check his impulses. That never works because nobody can check these people. But fine, no. that's what they feel. But also leaving the employ of someone like Trump with his culture of vindictive, vindictiveness and loyalty means that uh, you would be an outcast. So, right. so some people stay around, uh, even low, lower middle level people, because they don't want to face that. I mean, look at Cassidy Hutchinson. She had to go straight into hiding. She's in hiding with her family because it's so dangerous. Again, this is like the stuff of authoritarian, you know, juntas and all kinds of like, like uh, political thrillers. And yet it's happening right here, right now. Right here in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. I'm loving all this conversation. I think it's so great to think about this stuff. Let's just take a second to thank the sponsors who made this conversation possible. And we'll be right back after this with Ruth Ben-Ghiat. 
Today's podcast is brought to you by BASE. BASE, spelled B-E-I-S, is a luggage company created by actress Shay Mitchell that is everything you could possibly want in a piece of luggage. And I say this having just received the luggage at home. First of all, it's gorgeous. It just looks cool. Secondly, it has everything you could want in a piece of luggage. 360 degree gliding wheels, a cushioned handle, a built-in weight indicator, washable bags for your dirty clothes that have very clever expressions written on them, and then all the interior pockets you could ever need to keep yourself organized. The luggage comes in tons of sizes and colors, and for shorter trips, they have something called a weekender bag, which is super functional and goes right on top of the wheelie bag if you're carrying both. The luggage is designed to look better as it ages, so you don't have to worry about going in cargo or in the overhead. Base has over 30,000 five-star reviews, and I can honestly say I see why. It's gorgeous luggage. I mean, traveling is annoying enough. Why not have your luggage make it just a tiny bit easier and more glamorous? Right now, Base is offering our listeners 15% off your first purchase by visiting basetravel.com slash politicsgirl. Go to basetravel.com slash politicsgirl for 15% off your first purchase. That's B-E-I-S travel.com slash politicsgirl. And I don't usually do this, but I'm probably going to take a picture of it and put it on Instagram because honestly, it is so freaking nice. Basetravel.com. Hi guys. So we're doing an upcoming episode called Ask PG. If there's anything you ever wanted to ask about politics, American government, being an immigrant, having a terminal disease, or just something you just wondered about me, please send your questions to ask at politicsgirl.com and we will try to get to as many questions as we can in an upcoming episode. Again, that's ask at politicsgirl.com and email a question or record yourself asking one and we'll try and include it on the show. I want to thank our listeners again for supporting the show and this battle for American democracy. None of this would be possible without you and I am deeply grateful to my listeners for caring enough to be here. All right, back to the show. That's why it's so essential that we vote to make sure these people don't get another bite at the apple, right? Because like we said, we're not going to get this lucky again. We were just lucky that not enough judges were willing to act in a corrupt manner or not enough military leaders were on board for martial law, or he didn't have enough people on his staff, like an AG that was willing to follow through with his plan. But that won't happen again, right? Which kind of brings me to that article that Jonathan Swan just put out for Axios, which I'm sure you know intimately. Um, For those of you who haven't read it, I would highly recommend you read it. It's called Inside Trump 25, A Radical Plan for Trump's Second Term. And Swan writes this, what I think is absolutely terrifying article that breaks down how top Trump allies are preparing to kind of radically reshape the federal government if and when he is reelected, including potentially purging tens of thousands of career civil servants and replacing them with loyalists who 100% subscribe to that America first ideology. And as I ask you about the importance of surrounding yourself as with loyalists, which is key for authoritarians, I think we need to be really clear that this plan that they have underway doesn't even really need Trump to be implemented, right? Like in many Mm -hmm. ways, the way the Republican Party is behaving right now, stripping voting rights, protesting rights, women's rights, gay rights, civil rights, the plan Trump has for the second term is kind of the same plan for any potential Republican leader at this point, if it's a DeSantis, if it's Tucker Carlson himself, because the party is clearly on board for abandoning democracy for some form of authoritarianism, because they know they can't win in a democratic world anymore. So they're moving on. What do you think about yeah. that? Yeah, I think that's right. I actually discuss uh, this. This started under Trump, Trump 1.0, let's say. Um, and I discuss <laughs> it a lot in, in Strongmen because it's there's it's got a name uh, and again it's for authoritarians it's called divide and rule when you surround yourself with loyalists and you have that's the biggest requirement for serving in the government it's not if you're uh, competent or professionally good it's if you're loyal yeah. and and the div- divide and rule is that they pit each other they pit people against each other who's going to be more loyal right but This happened already during Trump one, where sometimes it was passive, like at the EPA, they made uh, like thousands of people left because they made it essentially a a hostile workplace. Um, The DOJ, the same thing. So it was more of what we call a passive purge. Um, They did fire people, but they mostly made it impossible for other people to hang around and they left. This will be a whole other thing, and this will be, it's, there's a name for it, autocratic capture, where you, you, 
very aggressively. And sometimes it's over time, like Viktor Orban in Hungary, he's done this. He's pushed out non-loyalists. So has Erdogan in Turkey. You push out non-loyalists, you silence the dissenters. And, and in Erdogan's case, you put them 100,000 people in jail. Um, and, and, but so it will be much faster. That's what I was referring to before. The pace will be very speedy this time. Uh, because right. Trump one will look as a rehearsal for Trump two. And it's true, your point about we don't need Trump anymore. I do think that I, I agree with you completely that this is the trajectory of the party. However, for uh, the divide and rule thing to work, you do need a bullying personality. And unfortunately, uh, we have DeSantis. And I started writing about him last year in 2021 because I, I felt honestly, a little bit the same when I first saw Trump. Uh, he doesn't have the range of criminality of Trump. There's nobody else like Trump who is criminal in so many ways. But I felt- No, but DeSantis is astounding in his ability to morph yeah. his personality for what needs to be done. I've never seen anyone- I mean, he won- in Florida, if he did in fact win, because I think Florida is quite suppressed yeah. voting wise. Uh, but he won by sheer pandering to the Trump campaign. I've never seen a campaign know. that was so, so gregaciously and gregariously like ass kissing. It was just Do you remember that nauseating. Campaign you would ad? think the campaign. Ad oh my God. I remember that campaign at, his with his infant build the wall. I love that part. You're fired. It was the most over the top boot licking campaign I've ever seen in my life. And I thought as a voter, I would think, come on, man, like have some self-respect. And yet he won. Mm -hmm. And then he has built himself up to a point where uh, uh, he could take the throne. And I find that astounding. And yeah, um, yeah, I actually hope he and Trump go head to head because the ego is too much for. I agree that the uh, mentor can, you know, has problem with it. That's what I'm hoping. <laughs> I call him. I, I unfortunately he he reminds me of uh, Mussolini, in that uh, the see these guys have success because they tell each group what they want to to hear. Exactly and his what they smile, want to hear. Next yeah. time, next time you watch DeSantis in one of his uh, public appearances. Look at his smile, how fake it is. He's an actor. And, um, yeah. and I'm, very, I'm very worried about him. But uh, so the first essay I wrote, I think it was for my uh, newsletter, Lucid, it, it said, you know, he's building a mini autocracy in Florida. And I have a quote from a Republican state legislator who was anonymous. It said, if you cross him, you're dead. And I thought, well, who does this sound like? This sounds like Trump. So he, so it's yeah. you to have the full effect of all the things we've talked about. Um, you ha you do have to have a bit of a bullying personality because you want to instill not um, admiration or love or to be liked. You want to be feared, and that's the key yeah. for a strong man. And unfortunately, um, for us, uh, DeSantis has that quality and all the other qualities too. So even if. If it's not Trump running in 2024, it could be a DeSantis, right? And this same plan that uh, Jonathan Swan was talking about uh, could be implemented, right? I mm -hmm. mean, Trump, like I said, he never thought he was going to win in 2016. So they were kind of diddling around trying to find the light switches uh, <laughs> when they first became you know, leaders. But this time would be the complete opposite, right? They saw how close they got to remaining in power. And once you're in power and you're an authoritarian type personality, that could be remaining in power indefinitely, right? The mm -hmm. American presidency is a sweet deal and they're not messing around. If they get another shot at it, that's it, right? So they have entire groups devoted to shaping policies, to identifying their top people, to putting together an alternative labor force, to preparing for the legal challenges that they're gonna have to face to make sure they get before Trump friendly judges and all the way up to Trump's six, three Supreme court. Right. According to Jeffrey Clark, who Trump wanted to make AG because he was willing to toe the line. Trump has learned his lesson and he'll never appoint anyone again, especially not an attorney general who's not completely on board with his That's agenda. Right. So as American people, we need to kind of get our heads around the fact that it doesn't matter if you've always voted Republican. It doesn't matter even yeah. what you want policy wise or any of these things. We could literally end up, with an entire federal government 
full of people who have no idea how to do their job, no experience, no preparation to run the departments, just surrounded by people who also have no qualifications to work in those departments, past the desire to put Trump as number one or the Republican leader as number one, and maybe the desire to see a white nationalist Christian agenda fulfilled, right? Like, Oh, yeah, have that's this key. Com- Right. It's, I think that's what we've got well, as you, a baseline. You, right. So, yeah, you end up with you end up with um, sometimes they, it's not that they're all incompetent, but they have to be uh, often uh, idea, ideologues or fanatics. They have to be okay. in all. the. I'm way. talking about those mid-level people yeah. they're going to replace those mid-level yeah. people. It's like if your number one goal is, um, are you a Trump supporter? Do you uh, are you pro America first? If you're good at environmental policy is irrelevant. That's right. And, and that's why the in, in actual dictatorships that last a long time, one of the saddest things that happens is uh, a deprofessionalization. You, and we already saw under Trump that people were just abandoning their professional ethics. Um, and even like and even in like Fox News news, uh, Hannity, you know, he's Sean Hannity, uh, one of the hosts says, well, Oh, I'm, you know, he says, I'm, I have a, I have a news, I have a news show, but he doesn't even like call himself a journalist anymore. And people really. Gets them out of lawsuits, apparently. (laughs) Yeah. And people who, who survive dictatorships, the journalists don't know how to do their jobs anymore because they become over years mouthpieces for propaganda. And so the U.S. and other uh, democracies used to have training programs for people who, came out of dictatorships to teach them how to be journalists again. <laughs> and, and, and this happens in many fields um, because corruption and propaganda and violence, those are the things that dominate. Um, so it's, it's really the long-term effects are, are absolutely devastating on society. So I just hope for my country, yeah. we don't, we don't go there. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think it would be fair to say if we let us go there, we would be entering some sort of Christo fascist yes. dark ages, right? Where a minority of religious extremists used an illegitimate president along with the subversion of our legislative procedures and an ultra conservative Supreme Court that we stacked with right wing partisan judicial activists, right? Every single one of them was chosen by the Federalist Society, which is a private far right legal group whose entire purpose seems to be to roll back human and civil rights uh, in favor of establishing some sort of legal precedent that's almost entirely founded on Christian ideology. They've overturned Roe. They're calling for the end of abortion federally, the end of access to birth control, the end of same-sex marriage, even the end of interracial marriage was just voted against by the Republican Party in the House. And that's all while stripping voting rights from people who disagree with them, right? And attempting to undermine our public education in favor of charter and religious schools. So I think people really need to very clearly see what we're up against. And you, as someone who studies this historically, I mean, where where would you place us here? I mean... Now that the door is open to authoritarianism, do we have to walk through it? Um, it's very important what happens in the midterm elections. Uh, and, yeah. and it's also really important not to give up hope because it's Definitely. difficult because we're exhausted still from the, you know, January 6th meant that we were not able to celebrate the achievement that we, with our nonviolent protests, uh, especially uh, the Black Lives Matter protests, which directly influenced voting turnout. We were not able to enjoy the fruits of this enormous victory. We did something that very few countries have done. We interrupted a process of autocratic capture of a demagogue who was on his way to consolidating his power, and we booted him out. Um, we did that. So we have to hold on to that. But many people right now are are demoralized and there's a kind of discourse going around that that mass nonviolent protest doesn't work. And I've been writing in my newsletter about how it does work because this is very dangerous if we become fatalistic. Um, Tell me why it does work. Tell me, tell me why. Well, just to keep to our own country, we had two examples that we don't talk about the women's march. Uh, anymore, but uh, the Women's March directly uh, inspired thousands of women to run for office, and many were elected during the midterms in 2018. 
So that worked. Yeah. That worked. Yeah. At, that worked at the level, not only for morale and optics, but it worked to start a replenishing of the democratic ranks. We had a record number of, of women of color coming in, um, you know, all kinds of firsts because of the women's march. And then we had Black Lives Matter protests. 20 million people participated in a Black Lives Matter protest event. And it was multiracial, multigenerational. It was truly national. And we kind of... And it was during a pandemic. During a Imagine pandemic. Imagine if the pandemic hadn't been on, right? And we did that. We did that. And and so it's. I am a little frustrated that there's this discourse that, it, that it's not worth doing. The only place that where it becomes very, very difficult to do, like there's a reason in Russia... Uh, Alexei Navalny, who's now sitting in jail, but uh, they had very successful mass protests up through 2019. And then so many people were getting arrested that Navalny's foundation decided to pursue an electoral strategy. But that's Putin's Russia. That's a dictatorship that's 20 years old. We don't, we right. have freedom still to, pr- protest is becoming much more difficult. It's becoming criminalized, but we have to use the rights that we have, the spaces that we have when we have them. That's one lesson of yeah. what I study. And while we have them, I mean, you said the thing yeah. is the midterm elections, right? Like people have always heard us say, oh, this is the most important election of our lifetime. But this really is, right? The only thing standing between us and a complete fascist takeover of America is electing Democrats up and down the ballot in the midterm elections and then expanding that democratic control in 2024. Mm-hmm. Um, as I read someone say this week, I have become a one issue voter and that is removing Republicans from power because they can't be trusted with it. And I think if people focus like that, it has nothing to do with left or right. No. It has nothing to do with red or blue. No. Um, because if, if we don't, if the outcome of the midterms is to give the Republicans a lot of power, the next two years, uh, quite apart from the 2024 election, the, the road to getting there could be very rocky and unpredictable. A lot of American conservatives, and I use that term loosely because I don't think it means what it used to mean, but they really do seem on board for this kind of domination-based, white, straight Christian America, right? And you can see that with them holding up countries like Orban, right? And yeah. Hungary and as the kind of society we should be emulating, you know? I mean, they love Orban, right? He's their guy now. Tucker Carlson talks about him every night to his millions of viewers. Tucker's own father is a lobbyist for Orban. Yeah. Trump himself enthusiastically endorsed Orban. They had the CPAC conference in Hungary with Orban as the keynote speaker, right? And here's Orban out here saying Western nations shouldn't be mixed race nations. And and he's blatantly racist. He's anti-gay. He's anti-immigrant. He has shut down the free press completely. And this is who American conservatives love. Like I, yeah, I find it terrifying. And you know what we're not hearing. Uh, I wrote a couple of pieces for a newsletter on this because what didn't we hear from Tucker Carlson when he uh, did this unprecedented thing of having a whole week of broadcasts from Orban's Hungary. We didn't hear that Orban has closed down 300 churches He's Mr. Savior of Christendom, but he closed down 300 churches because they were uh, helmed by non-loyalists. And that's the same as what Erdogan does in Turkey. He's got like, you know, he's arrested thousands and thousands of followers of a rival Muslim cleric. So we need to hear about Orban closing down churches and persecuting Christians. Uh, But, you know, to go back to the States, one thing that is uh, flies under the radar a little bit, because we we hear justifiably so much about evangelical Christians who anointed Trump as there by God, as did Orthodox Jews, and they're allied with non-denominational Christians as a mass churches, right? But there's also an alliance with extreme right-wing Catholics. Um, and one of the through lines I, I wasn't expecting to find in my book is there's a secretive uh, far-right Catholic society called Opus Dei. And, Opus Dei. and they yep. were very prominent in uh, Franco Spain, in Pinochet's Chile. Um, they had very high positions of economic policy advisors in these dictatorships. Then they go to Berlusconi's Italy, which he was the first to bring fascists back into the government in the 90s. 
And then we find them, this was surprising to me, many of Trump's cabinet are members or affiliated or, or close to Opus Dei, including the White House lawyer who's been in the hearings recently, Pat Cipollone, William Barr. Those two were on the board of the Center for Catholic Information in Washington, which is an Opus Dei. Uh, Larry Kudrow, Kudlow, who was uh, economic advisor, was converted from Judaism to Catholicism by the priest who was the head of this Catholic Information Center. So this alliance of right-wing Catholics and... Uh, it's also a number of the Supreme Court justices. That's right. So these, this is, these are basically these authoritarian uh, strains of religion have always partnered with people like Trump. And they're very powerful in the states, and we sometimes don't uh, focus on the fact that the Catholics too have this type of extreme Catholic, uh, which doesn't represent again numerically uh, the mass of Catholics in the U.S. the way they think, but they have extreme power. Well, it's uh, authoritarians, strong men, dictators, and religion have always gone very well together because yeah. they both. Uh, they both work on top down. That's right. right. Top down command. Fear. These are the rules. You follow the rules. You're fine. You don't follow the rules. You're ostracized. You're thrown out. You're thrown in jail. They kind of are enmeshed. And I, you know, it's the reason that back in the you know 1400s, you know, it would be the church and the king, That's and right. they would work together. That's how you control the people. And unfortunately, America is not supposed to work like that. We're we're supposed to be a, a liberal nation with a separation of church and state. And we watch every day as that is eroded in front of our eyes. Um, so what do we do? You know, where do we go from here? Do you have any pearls of wisdom to inspire us at this scary crossroad we sit at? Aside from, and I really do appreciate you saying we cannot lose faith because we have done great things. And I think what I always say to people is, we are the majority of the country still. The yeah. majority of the country is not on board for this. So what did the majority of us do to stop this from happening? Yeah, I think, um, I think getting, I'm, I'm haunted by the huge number of millions of Americans who didn't vote, who don't vote. Right. I think it's important to reach out yeah. to, uh, it's sometimes not, uh, people don't want to do this, but reach out to the, uh, right-wing Republicans in your life, um, because all the studies show that if you just leave them be, uh, they go further into their silos. So you have to build bridges um, with them and try and uh, you know reason with them. You can't really give up. Um, or just people who... We know a fair amount of Republicans right now who have always voted with their wallets. And this reversal yes. of bro and then the behavior of the Republicans since that has really shook them. And yes. I find that that I feel like there's a bridge to be there built is. there for there sure. Is. I've, I've started talking to business groups uh, because um, there's a myth that authoritarian law and order rule is good for business. And I'm here to tell them that it's not good for business, just as gun violence. No, all you have to do yeah. is look at Ron DeSantis punishing Disney right. for not not liking what he what he wrote in his "Don't Say Gay" bill. You know, that's right. That's that's, that's a government, future. Pu you know, yeah. punishing a private company. That is the future if we let them in the door. So that's there's a lot of outreach to do there, um, to to sh and and really even with gun violence, there's a way to message this so it doesn't become about you know, going to take my guns away. It's about outcomes. Yes or no, is $280 million a year cost of gun violence, is that good for America or not? Well, I, nobody would answer that it's good for America. And it's the same with political strife, which is on its way. There's, a you know, in violence and people not talking to each other and low level, um, you know, tensions all the time. Is that good for business? No, it's not. It's not good for business. No, it's bad for the market. It's bad yeah. for volatility. It's bad for all these things. And, and any sort of in-your-face violence. I mean, you look at the insurrection, right? These white nationalists are standing back and standing by as we speak. They are That's dying right. to use the they weapons they've been collecting on us. So I think that um, there are ways to reach out to sectors of society um, and, and talk to them, uh, which is what I and others are trying to do. Um, ways to try and get people to vote, ways to try and bring people back from their, um, 
their dungeon of disinformation. Um, those are things that, and, and really, I believe that we have to work. You know how we, we, we can say, I'm going to take care of my health every day. I'm going to walk 10,000 steps with my Fitbit. I'm going to do this. I'm going to eat better. We have to weave democracy protection and do something every day for democracy. And we're not used to having to do that in the States. Right. I totally changed right. my entire professional life when Trump came on the scene. Um, I put aside an academic So did book. I. You, you've done this. <laughs> so did I. And you know what? I, I, yeah. like the, I wish the media would tell the stories of, of how many people have transformed their lives out of, out of love for the country, out of you know, civic duty, um, because that inspires other people. Um, and That's teaches right. them that they can do this too, or they can do some of it. They can do something. They can do it too. Absolutely. So those are, those are some things that I, I would say. Um, that's the direction yeah, to go. Not in. a single race should go uncontested. We should be out there in force. I always say be responsible for your people. And that means the people at your dining room table saying disinformation to your hairdresser to um, I have my entire cleaning lady and her whole family voting now. They didn't vote before. Exactly. And they're like, explain this to me and explain this to me. Those are our people. We, we are responsible for our people. And we have those conversations. And mostly we want to, if you can build a bridge to a Trumper, knock yourself out. If you can build a bridge to a traditional Republican? Absolutely. But if you can build a bridge to someone who doesn't vote, that's the largest voting bloc in the country. Bigger than Republicans, bigger than Democrats are the non-voters. And if you can get them interested, then it changes the entire game. So I guess that's the best we can do for right now. We have to acknowledge the truth, admit the problem, and then fight with all of our might against it. That's right. Uh, if you were ever proud of America for defeating the Nazis, then you have to vote for Democrats now because this fascist movement is alive and well in the American Republican Party. Well said. <laughs> I want to thank you for joining me today, Ruth. I mean, this is some terrifying stuff, uh, but it's essential that we understand if we're going to beat it. Now, if people want to hear more from you or follow your work moving forward, what's the best way to do that? You can find me on Twitter at Ruth Ben-Ghiat, all, all one word. Um, I have a website uh, that's www.ruthbengiat.com. And both those places, you can uh, sign up for my newsletter called Lucid, which it's free to subscribe. And that's where I do a lot of it's writing. It's terrific. The Lucid Substack yeah. newsletter is great. I will say I really love it. I'm getting so oh, much out of it. Thank you. And that's where I'm writing a lot about um, these, these issues and will continue to do so. That's wonderful. Well, thank you again for joining me and just keep up the very important work. We'll... Well, we can do it. I think we can do it. I feel very positive. People think I'm crazy, but I really do feel very positive. I believe in the American people. Same here. And what we really stand for. Thanks so much. So that was Ruth ben Giot, author, professor, and expert on authoritarianism, reminding us that we are not powerless, that we have elections just around the corner where we can tell this party of authoritarianism and the strongmen types that would have them lead us, no. No, we will not be led by your far right-wing Christian theocracy. No, we are not going to willingly give up our rights. No, we will not let you purge our government and fill it with loyalists. No, you will not dictate what we read and see and hear. No, we will not devolve into a nation of white supremacy and violence. No. There are more of us than there are of you, and we will reach out to them. We will inspire them. We will register them, and we will vote. We've disrupted your power before, and we can do it again. I want to thank Ruth for joining us today and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Now go out and make the world a better place. Until next week, PG out. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.